All right, cool. Uh, so welcome everybody to the afternoon session. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Siddharth Parman. So Siddharth did his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and then was a postdoc at Caltech for some years where we shared an office. Uh, following that, he joined ISC. So Siddharth has received many awards for his work, including Ramanujan Fellowship, the Pratiksha Trust Young Investigator Award, and the International Academy of Engineers Young Engineer Award as well. He works in multiple areas, including approximation in online algorithms, learning and game theory. And today he's going to talk about fair division, particularly, I think, focusing on welfare maximization. So this is an area that's quite popular and has multiple applications. And I think he's also going to combine it with online algorithms, uh, including, um, uh, yeah, uh, we may be touching on some work that he did with Darendram as well. So I'm glad that we're getting to hear about it. Um, Siddharth, please go ahead. Hey, thanks, thanks, Sumang, for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's encouraging to see a flourishing algorithms community in India. So um, I'll talk about multiple joint works. So I'll mention the specific co-authors when, when I get to the technical results. Um, also, feel free to sort of uh, interrupt in between and ask question or share feedback. So yeah, you don't have to hold your questions to, till the end. You can just ask them as the talk progresses. Let me- Sarah, Sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt on what I just wanna ask participants to please mute themselves if you're not asking a question. There were some interruptions earlier. So, you know, it's better so that could continue. Um, Great. Yeah, unless you have questions. Great, sorry, go ahead. Okay, thanks. So uh, let me start with, a, with the following observation that typically uh, quite often we use the arithmetic mean, the average um, and quite often without much thought as a standard way to combine numbers and assess quality. And there are many, many practical examples, like think of uh, CGPA, the cumulative grade point average, that's nothing but the average of your grades across the semesters, or uh, like ranking products looking at their average rating. So that's again an arithmetic mean of ratings using which you sort of uh, rank objects on e-commerce uh, websites. And even in academic circles, uh, we use average number of students graduated, uh, citation counts and so on. So this uh, as a metric of performance, as a quality measure. And this is not just confined to say uh, pedestrian applications, even in settings where uh, the objective functions are revered objects, things like uh, uh, in many AI and ML contexts, uh, we end up using arithmetic mean as the default performance metric, as the default objective function. So for example, think of accuracy in your classification settings. That not, that's nothing but the average of the performance of your classifier across different data points, across different data sets. Regret, which is sort of a very, um, the, the standard performance metric in online and reinforcement learning, uh, cumulative regret is also the arithmetic mean of the algorithm's performances. So fine, like uh, th that's that's a if we are looking for allocative efficiency, then arithmetic mean is a important metric. But the point I want to emphasize, the high level takeaway of the talk, is that there are other ways of combining numbers. There are, and especially in contexts where fairness and collective welfare are important considerations, one must sort of revisit this uh, like this default or knee jerk objective function of the arithmetic mean and try to understand if there are better alternatives. So um, I will define what generalized means are and I'll like spell out what do I mean by axiomatic support. But what I want to say is that uh, this is rather a distinguishing feature of the entire exercise that will sort of conduct for these two lectures. That is that I am going to give you a class of functions, a family of objective functions, a family of welfare functions that enjoy like fundamental axiomatic support. There are axioms that are very natural in fairness context. And I'll give you a family of functions that actually will characterize these axioms. So this is going to be a rather, I'll not, I'll try to, my focus will be on algorithms, but this is something that I'd like to impress upon right at the beginning. But this is not only based on saying, based on your aesthetic senses and saying, look, here's, a, here's another interesting problem. Here's a very natural function to look at. This entire endeavor has a 
axiomatic support and like very classical textbook um, axiomatic support. And of particular interest in this family of generalized means will be what is called a NAS social welfare. So I'll expel out the technical details in a minute. But this is one member of this family, an important member of this family of <clears throat> generalized means. This is the geometric mean of values. So uh, down the road, three months uh, from now, if you want to remember something, just remember that, yeah, um, geometric mean could be an important objective for you to study, it, it, both algorithmically interesting and it enjoys uh, these um, ag fairness axioms. So um, that's sort of the overarching theme of the talk. This is sort of the takeaway. And uh, these means, both geometric and like the generalized family, are relevant in many contexts, in particular like the AI and ML context that I specified. But our focus will be on fair division context, fair division settings, where I would want to distribute certain resources, certain goods among partition goods or resources among N agents um, to maximize a welfare objective and a welfare objective that has um, axiomatic backing. Uh, throughout, whenever I say the word agent, I mean people or entities participating in this division exercise. So I'll have goods, certain resources, I'll be distributing them among entities. These people, these entities are going to be referred to as agents. And I'll just use N to denote the number of uh, such agents. I've designed the talk to be really sort of minimal in terms of notation, but N is sort of something that I'll just carry forward. So uh, let me be a bit more specific. So imagine that I divide the partition or divide or allocate these resources among the N agents and it induces these N values. So based on what each agent got, uh, V1 through Vn are their values. So V1 is the value which uh, agent one accrues under one a specific division, V2 is the value of the second agent and so on. So I have these N values, different divisions will induce different values. The question at hand, the basic question at hand is how do I assess the quality, quantitatively assess the quality of this uh, division? What is my welfare objective? So the most natural one, like the one that I started out with is the arithmetic mean, also called social welfare or utilitarian welfare. It's just the average of uh, these values, right? Um, fine, a great, me uh, great measure if you're so if, if your key focus is allocative efficiency, but it's not hard to see that this is not a, uh, not a nice metric to have or not a nice metric to maximize towards or not a nice metric to judge divisions by, uh, by sort of very standard critiques. Things like if I could give you a division where 1% of these agents own or are given pretty much all of the goods, right? So this 1%, 99% thing, in that case, the social welfare, this arithmetic mean can be high, but it's not a fair way to divide things. In economic thought, this is called Benthamite uh, objective. I am, I'll use the word social welfare. It's, it's like Pavlovian for me. And this is in bed without a moment's thought. I'll just, whenever I say social welfare, I'll mean this uh, expression, the arithmetic mean. But yeah, if you want me to sort of repeat what it is, uh, just stop me and I'll be happy to do that. The other important metric in this space, which is purely a fairness criterion, is uh, what is called egalitarian welfare. So I pick a division, I look at the induced values by the division. So agent one is getting V1, agent two is getting V2, so on and so forth. So throughout N is the number of agents, the subscripts will denote the agent's index. So uh, V1 is agent one's value, so on and so forth. And the egalitarian welfare looks at a division and says, okay, I want to maximize the minimum value across all the agents. So it's the min across these VIs and divisions that achieve high uh, egalitarian welfare are fair. Like they are, and this sort of comes from this uh, Rawlsian uh, criterion of justice. And this welfare is also uh, referred to as the Rawlsian welfare in literature. So these are two extremes, one which is purely looking at a fairness consideration and might sacrifice allocative efficiency. The other end of the spectrum is arithmetic mean, which uh, looks purely at, essentially at uh, allocative efficiency and looks at the arithmetic mean. 
So what I'll define is a family that will encompass both. In fact, with a single parameter, it will cover this entire spectrum and an important middle ground, uh, axiomatically important middle ground is achieved by this geometric mean, which is called, referred to as the Nash social welfare. And this is nothing but the geometric mean of the valuations that the agents acquire under any distribution. So these are the three important welfare functions I'll be sort of uh, starting out with. And indeed, Nash social welfare achieves a balance between the two extremes, by which I mean, it's, uh, it's a mean, so it's at least the minimum uh, value. So you have this left-hand side inequality. Uh, the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality tells me that the geometric mean is less than the arithmetic mean. So I have this inequality. So for any division and hence for any induced collection of N valuations, you will have this inequality. The, and the idea is, okay, instead of focusing on just one extreme, how about uh, looking at this entire spectrum and trying to design algorithms that perform well for those. Um, and yeah, I will stop uh, harping about the axiomatic thing, but to me, that's quite important. And in particular, these functions that I'll define in a few minutes satisfy what is called the pigo dalton principle. It's a fairness axiom. And it says that I, we want a welfare function, a mean, if you will, um, a way to combine these values such that um, informally Robin Hood operations improve the welfare value. That is what Pigo Dalton says, is that if I take epsilon from a high VI epsilon value and give that epsilon to a low VJ, the welfare function value should increase. And you can see that, fine, like in NAS social welfare, that is indeed the case. In fact, it strictly increases. If I balance out the VIs by some other distribution, the geometric mean of values increases. So that's that's one axiom that is satisfied by now social welfare and other members of the family that I'm about to define, or other members of this generalized mean family. The other important axiom that's satisfied by now social welfare is that it is scale free. That is, it doesn't matter in on what in, in what currencies the agents are looking at their values. So I can be looking at my values, say in rupees, Umang might be looking at it in dollars. So which is that multiplying by some uh, positive uh, integer, positive real number, even then the ordering among the allocations or the divisions does not change. Okay. That's an, another important axiom. There are others like symmetry, independence of unconcerned agents. And in fact, there's a set of natural fairness axioms and the family of generalized means and in, in up to standard transformation characterizes those axioms. That is, these functions are exactly the ones that will satisfy this uh, axiomatic grounding. Um, fine, I will stop talking about axioms, but yeah, it, it, it's important to appreciate the sort of the bedrock on which all these functions are built. They're not just natural candidates when talking about fair division, they are in fact uh, axiomatically the class of functions, or the, the class of welfare functions to look at. So uh, I think there's a chat question. Oh, what do you mean by symmetry here? I mean, uh, if I give you a division, so is that the valuation kind of uh, permutes across? So I look at two divisions, wherein uh, the valuation, the collection of valuations is the same, it's just been permuted, permuted across the agents, the welfare value stays the same. So the, yeah, I guess that answers the question. Uh, if not, you can just, let me know. Okay, uh, fine. Yeah, Wang, can you just keep track of the chart and let me know if this. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the family of functions I'm going to look at will have this following form. It is parameterized by a single term P. So there's an exponent parameter P. And as I change P, I get different means, different instantiations. And it has the following form. So it looks at the pa pth powers of the valuations that the agents have, the N agents have under different distributions. And then I take their mean, take their app, uh, divide them, like divide the sum by one over N, and exponentiate the whole thing by one over P. So it does look like a norm, but there are two things I want to point out. The first is that there is a one over N, N here, unlike the standard norm definition. And the other more important one is that this is actually meaningful for values of P that are less than equal to one. So P norms are convex, they're norms for 
when p is more than one, here I'm looking at p means, p generalized means, uh, and the range of p that I'm interested in is one, like uh, num p's that are less than equal to one. So when I set p equal to one, I get the standard arithmetic mean, this just reduces to this expression. When p tends to zero, this expression tends to the geometric mean. This is a exercise in La Pital. And here, when you do this calculus exercise, you'll see the relevance of this one over n. And when p tends to minus infinity, I get the minimum value. So that's the egalitarian welfare. So as I change p, I get this entire family of welfare functions, which characterize, which are the family of welfare functions that satisfy a set of fairness axioms alluded to in the previous slide. So p equal to minus one would be the harmonic mean, so on and so forth. So this is our theme. This is the protagonist of the two uh, talks. And I'll throughout focus in vari various contexts, I'll focus on dividing goods to maximize this welfare function. So that's the, that's the overarching theme of the talk. So, okay, now uh, that's what the talk is going to be about. What is the talk not going to be about? What are things that I'm kind of punting on? And hopefully someone will talk about this in the next edition of Recent Trends. Uh, there are many other notions of fairness. In particular, NB freeness is a very sort of quintessential cri fairness criterion. I could have very easily centered both the talks on NB freeness and variants thereof. Yeah, I thought there are more open problems in this uh, welfare thread, so I picked that. There are things that look at markets and con constructs called co competitive equilibrium with equal incomes. It's another important notion in this uh, broad social choice theory, fair division literature, many others. Um, I am going to focus on goods. So throughout, I'll look at cases where the values that the agents acquire under different divisions, under different subsets of goods that are allocated to them are non-negative, but you can also think of a chore division. So dividing things that are negatively valued, that's uh, another important line of work. Uh, I'm going to, like focus on settings where I, for example, I presume that I'll know these agents preferences. I know these valuations. Of course, game theoretic um, ideas, like uh, what if the agents are strategic, um, truthful mechanisms, so on and so forth are quite important as well. Um, I'll focus on cardinal preferences throughout. That is, I'm going to assume that agents have numeric values to fractions of goods they get or bundles they receive. Um, there's also a line of work that looks at ordinal preferences, like uh, where you don't have numeric values associated with divisions or subsets or fractions of goods. Rather, you just have an ordering that I prefer this over that um, and so on. I'll also not talk about monetary transfers. That is, uh, um, I'll only assume that th there's a division and no subsidies, or I can't pay money to sort of like cover up fairness gaps. Even in the context of formulations, there are many others. So like, yeah, the one line summary of this slide is there are many other things. I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll give you textbook references where you can look this up and uh, some recent surveys. Um, but yeah, like in terms of alternative formulations um, for things like uh, wealth gap or in income inequality, uh, organizations like the World Bank use uh, metrics like the Gini uh, coefficient, uh, Renier entropy, Jens index. And there's in fact a alternative uh, axiomatization in network resource allocation context called the Lang Chiang uh, axiomatization. So um, yeah, this is all that is I'm not going to cover. This is what I'm going to focus on, uh, P-mean welfare. And so like, yeah, for the two talks, this is going to obsess about maximizing this function for values of P that are less than equal to one. Let me just pause for a second and see if there are questions or. Nothing so possible. Okay. The one you answered, yeah. Excellent. So before I get to the technical things, let me point out some applications. I have two, uh, there are two purposes here. The first one is that I want to impress upon you the fact that this is not all stylized uh, exercise. There are real world um, use cases for what I'm talking about. So these are applications with empirical backings. The other motivation is that through these applications, I'll be able to extract out a taxonomy, which will, which will let me sort of uh, organize the like literature. It will let me organize the, the parts, the remaining parts of the talk. Okay, 
So the first uh, fair division application use case I want to talk about is this uh, work by Deng et al. This was done in Singapore in the context of public housing units. So Singapore allocates housing units across uh, families. So these are government owned houses that are given out to families. Um, the I point here is that the resources being allocated are houses, they are like apartments. Uh, the agents participating in this fair division exercise are different groups of people. So one, like in particular, Singapore by law would want to ensure fairness across different ethnic groups. So that's a, a nice sort of context where uh, what I'm going to talk about is applicable at least at an abstract level. And in particular, Benabao extracted out a very nice mathematical framework for this setting. And so that's also worth looking at. The point I want to focus here is uh, the resource or the good being allocated is an indivisible entity. It's a house. So it doesn't really make sense for me here to say that, oh, two thirds of the house is given to this family, one third to some other family. That really doesn't make sense. So here it's a discrete, it's a combinatorial problem where I want to allocate ho housing as an indivisible item, as an indivisible good to uh, each agent, to each family. That's um, application one. The second, like, which has been rather influential is this work by Budish et al. So this is a tool that's used in Wharton to a fairly assigned course, a course allocation among students at, at, at Wharton. There's a previous uh, paper by Budish by himself, which has been rather quite influential in, in sort of uh, defining some fairness notions that are useful in the indivisible goods case. And here too, the resource being allocated are course C. So every course say has an upper bound, has a limit on the number of uh, students that can credit it. Different students are the participating agents in this exercise. They have different preferences, different specializations, different like uh, choices among courses. You want to divide them, allocate these seats among the students in a fair manner. So here again, the good that's being divided is indivisible. Uh, different agents have different preferences, you would want to sort of uh, find a fair division. So again, a use case where what we'll talk about uh, at least uh, an abstract level, this is this will be useful. Um, third example that I like is, is by a study by Alexandra et al. This was done in conjunction with Food Bank Australia, where they uh, have a hub, um, food donations come in and then they distribute this so every day they distribute this uh, collect, like, accumulated food across soup kitchens, across say canteens. So I know, for example, ISKCON does a similar thing in Bangalore. I'm sure there are other organizations in India that do that too. Uh, yeah, the takeaway, the sort of thing I want to highlight is that here the resource is food, which is essentially divisible. If I have 10 kgs of rice, it makes sense for me to say, okay, two thirds of this goes to the first soup kitchen, there are more people waiting in queue there. One thirds of this uh, 10 kg of bag of rice goes to some other soup kitchen and so on. So unlike the first two cases here, the goods are divisible. Um, and though the challenge here, and this is something that I'll sort of actually delve in detail is an online aspect to it. I have, I get a, like a batch of food, uh, some donation for that day. I have to distribute it. I cannot wait till I get like till the end of the month to make a allocative decision. So there's an online aspect to it, which I'll address in tomorrow's talk. The third example is the study by Olava uh, Suzy. This was done in Nigeria. They're dividing electricity. Um, uh, so load shedding as it's called in Nigeria. Um, they want to understand what is a fair way to do that. So here again, the resources electricity, you have some megawatts of, uh, that's being generated, you want to distribute it among different parts of the city, say, how do you do it so that overall, say in over a month time or over some time window, you're fair. The point to note that here, there's a contiguity requirement. You, can, you cannot uh, sort of give electricity for five minutes, cut it, give for five minutes and cut it. So while electricity has this fractional feature to it, there is a way to say, okay, I'm giving you 10.3 kilowatts of electricity. There's a contiguity requirement in the temporal sense. So um, yeah, different contexts, all, in all of which the welfare functions I talked about make sense, 
but the underlying context is, is different. Some are, have a divisible flavor to it. Some are continuous uh, optimization problems and some are discrete optimization problems. So fine, uh, I'll also quickly mention this widely used platform called Split It. Mm, it's quite often used for fair division of many things such as rent among flatmates, credit division in a, uh, in a project or dividing inheritance among uh, siblings. So um, these are the applications. Um, I'll jump into the math and the algorithmic framework, but like, let me just mention one thing that our focus is going to be instrumentative. I'm talking about algorithmic contributions. I'm not raising a debate about normative things in the sense that I'm not saying, okay, well, there's a debate to be had, especially like the use of uh, algorithmic and machine learning tools in socially sensitive decisions. Uh, that's not my agenda. My aim is to develop tools that practitioners can use. Um, so that, yeah, I'm, I'm approaching this as a computer scientist. Fine. Well, there was a question from Sushmita, I believe. Yeah, hey, hey, yeah, please. Um, so that application of uh, Bodish at all on courses, right. division, so the scope of that modeling, is it different, very different from that, what we are able to do using matching, like stable matching, rank maximal, all those sorts of things? There's a, uh, so yeah, like this is like, what you're saying is like a, a more like an ordinal preference. I hear there is a numeric kind of a thing. The other thing is like, it's not unit capacity per se, it's like in a match. So you would, you might be able to take three courses or four courses and so on. So it's more like a B matching setup. Right. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, like one way for me to sort of allude to that question is uh, it might be, it's like a hospital, um, uh, right. Of it. Hospital, so, yeah. Exactly. The lower capacity, upper capacity, when you have those sorts of things, right? right. And in there are the sort of a canonical way of transferring, at least in the context of matching ordinal to cardinal, cardinal to ordinal, like you can interpret the pre rank preferences as a cardinal utility function. Yeah. So instead of stability like or blocking as my criterion, I want fairness. So there might be blocking things, um, but I, I, I really hear like, what I care about is like a welfare across the entire batch of students rather than stability. Also, um, I don't have preferences on the other side as in if there are 100 seats, uh, I, like typically the instructors should not be um, like getting to cherry pick stu which students can take that. So that's also another, like I think distinct, like differentiating feature between the two. Okay, so it's, I see. So one thing is that there's no blocking notion of blocking pair, but you are trying to optimize an objective function and these means character those things and possibly there's no preferences from the instructor side. It's the utilities are from the student side. That... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and there are no transfers here as in like it's, it's sort of in bad form for me to say, okay, you didn't get this course. Here you go. hundred rupees. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. There's a pizza on me. So that, that, that that's not uh, sort of yeah, kosher in this context. Yeah, but it's it's a it's a good point. I I, I mean, the, actually, the maybe it's like my bias, but like when I see matching, it's in fact the question I ask is why not NAS social welfare there? So I, it's it's that's my sort of response to looking at recommend like things like recommendation system and all instead of stability, why not NAS welfare? So like that's the but I guess yeah, that's a perspective or a, a problem formulation thing which. It is somewhat context dependent. So, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, there is also a question on chat. Do you want to read it out? Let me just read it uh, easier, maybe. Yeah. Are there some theoretical applications of P means? Uh... Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, when you say theoretical applications, that's slightly ox exim like oxymoronic to me, but fine. Yeah, I see what, where you're getting at. Indeed, yeah. NAS so Pareto optimality is one criterion that I did not mention because I don't want to define Pareto optimality, but yeah, it does have connections. Uh, I mean, the undercurrent of what I'll talk about are those connections. I will, in fact, show you the connection in the other direction. I'll start with approximate envy freeness and end up at approximate now social welfare maximization. So yeah, um, it has connections and very interesting ones in very varied context. So yeah, if, if that, yeah, that's sort of the short answer of it. Okay, 
So uh, I talked about, is this good? Can I go on uh, slightly behind schedule, but yeah. Yeah, I think please go ahead, that's fine. So uh, we saw these applications, and inspired by that, I'll, I'll give you a taxonomy, it's a rather simple one. And uh, based on that, I'll, I'll, like, I'll sort of structure the remaining parts of the talk. So um, it's just qu quite as simple as like looking at whether you are facing a, a continuous optimization problem or a discrete one. So you can look at the good, the resource that's being divided. It can be divisible, it can be indivisible. So divisible things like uh, um, food, land, water, indivisible like housing units and courses. And so that's one way to partition the results. Furthermore, divisible goods can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. So heterogeneous, think of it like land. So a stretch of land, say in South Bombay, is much more valuable than the same length of, say, in Bangalore or in some outskirts of the city. So there are these heterogeneous re resources like spectrum allocation or transmission rights. So 10-minute advertisements, like a 10, like a 15-second advertisement slot after an IPL match is much more valuable than a 15-second after. Yeah, in the four, at, let's say 4 a.m. in the morning. <clears throat> or the divisible good can be homogenous. It's like 10 kgs of green, right? So if you get half of it, your value is half of the total value. It's, it's a homogenous good. So these heterogeneous good, goods are typically referred to as cakes. Um, and the ad nauseum an analogy being that different parts of the cake have different icing, so the value changes. These homogeneous types of divisible goods are typically studied in market settings. So um, I will not focus on markets, I'll rather, but I'll get to it. And the uh, indivisible ones are typically referred to as discrete fair division. That's a combinatorial problem. I will cover all the three leaves, or at least I'll try to cover all the three leaves. Uh, so today, what I'll do is start, start with cake division. So the leftmost heterogeneous divisible good um, I'll talk about Nash social welfares for this. So I'll try to maximize geometric mean un, in this setting. Um, tomorrow would we'll focus on the remaining two leaves. I'll talk about generalized mean welfare for these two contexts. So that's the, the sort of organization of the talk. And since I'm running late, let me just jump right in and let's start with some desert. Cake division, okay. So cake is used to refer to a divisible heterogeneous resource, divisible in the sense that here it makes sense to allocate fractional parts of it. So a sub interval can be assigned. Heterogeneous in the sense that different parts of the resource are valued differently by the agents. And this is a very well studied area of work, like almost seven decades of research behind it. The uh, seminal work of Stenhouse that sort of laid the mathematical foundations of fair division was conducted in the cake division context. There are textbooks written on it many, many popular science videos on the internet. It, it plays a very important role in this bigger umbrella of uh, fair division literature and social choice literature. And almost all the central solution, fairness solution concepts are sort of developed in the cake world and then they sort of um, morph or sort of mutate into other contexts. So there's a very small chosen list of references it's a huge literature. There are more textbooks just on cake division and its uses in like border disputes, so on and so forth. So, like very the basic protocols in this space, like how do you divide a cake fairly among two agents? In fact, that method has literally a biblical reference. So, yeah, this is something that has been studied for quite some time. Um, a bit more formally, the cake is modeled as the unit interval zero one. So the agents prefer sub interval. So that's the divisibility aspect of it. The heterogeneity is captured by the cardinal preferences, these preferences of the agent. So what I have here is the unit interval. I want to divide this unit interval that is give each agent a piece of this K zero one, a connected interval. And how are the preferences spe specified? Well, they're specified by a function VA that tells me what is the value of this interval i for agent A. So again, throughout subscript means the agent's identity. And here, um, if it helps you like uh, visualize things, imagine that there's a probability measure over the unit interval and agent A's value is nothing but the probability mass with respect to this uh, density function. It's this area of the curve. So for this interval and this density function of some agent A, 
BAI is A is valuation for this interval I. If I look at some other interval J, the area under the curve, that would be the valuation for uh, this interval capital J for this agent A. So uh, always remember subscript is agent's identity. So what do I want? I want to partition this resource, this interval zero one, such that each agent gets a connected piece, gets an interval, a sub interval. So these intervals are assigned again, based on agent's identity. So I one is the interval that gets assigned to agent one, I two is the interval that gets assigned to agent two, so on and so forth. So this figure, the left mode interval goes to agent A, then the second interval from the left goes to agent B and so on. Every agent has her own valuation function and they evaluate the interval they receive based on their preference, their valuation function. Note that um, the results I'll talk about do not require me to have explicit knowledge for these valuation functions, a standard Oracle model will work. So um, that, that's just a side note here. So my output, the what I want to find in some sense is N minus one cuts. So I'll make N intervals and assign them among the agents such that some fairness criterion is satisfied. So in this line, the fundamental notion of fairness is what quintessential notion of fairness is what is called NB freeness. And here it is. What it says is that, oh, I want a division such that every agent is satisfied with the interval that she receives. So I pick, pick, pick uh, any pair of agents AB. A looks at the value she receives for the interval that's been assigned to her. So VA is A's valuation, IA is the interval she, she has received. So that value should be at least as much as A's valuation for any other agent's interval. So note that both sides of the inequality are evaluated with respect to VA. So A would is satisfied with the interval IA that she has received and would not like to swap with anyone else. So that's, that's the uh, central construct here. Haven't seen this, uh, the, the next thing I'm about to say should surprise you. It still surprises me and uh, Point is that, okay, doesn't, isn't this too strong a requirement? I haven't imposed anything on the valuation. This could be, I haven't, like N can be very large. These valuations can be rather complex. Um, why are you, so isn't this such a tall order? Well, as it turns out that under very mild conditions on these valuation functions, one can show, and that Sue showed, that an NB free division always exists. This is a super surprising result. It, it, you, the proof uses uh, Sperner's lemma, combinatorial analog of uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem. It's a delightful proof, right? almost as delightful as eating a nice piece of cake. Right? And as internet as my witness, I love talking about it so much so that uh, I thought, okay, let me not do this again. If you want, I can just give you video references, but this is a proof from the book, like one of favorite things in this line of work, something that I strongly recommend that you go and watch or read. Even the original paper is very well written. So that's a major result. It's a major existential result that says that for very mild conditions, in fact, like all you need say, for example, is that the, these BAs are continuous. So as long as that happens, an NV free division will always exist. So this is a rather non-obvious fact, which if you haven't seen it should impress you. This is the only exclamated result I'll, I'll have in my entire slide deck. But as it so happens, ah, you have a question? Yeah, uh, so this value, this uh, allocation thing, it can uh, leave some portion of the interval unassigned? No, no, no. Nothing. Okay, so an empty Complete. allocation is not possible because that would be always be NB free. Exactly, yeah, yeah. No, the entire cake is partitioned into like, it's and it's not disconnected, every interval is get, Every agent is getting one single connected interval. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I have a question. Yes, please. So how is this uh, different from uh, uh, the perfect partitioning of the cake? And like, uh, so perfect also... means that your value for all the intervals is uh, is the same. So it could be that VA IESA is all like 0.9, and VA IV is point like zero. So that would be NV free. I 
I get a piece that I value a lot and I really don't care. Like I, I like cherry and you actually gave me the part of the cake that has cherry and I really don't like vanilla and the rest of the cake is vanilla and you gave it to others. So that is not a perfect division. Perfect cake division, the definition is slightly different. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm talking about uh, this uh, result by uh, Noga Allen or something. Uh, it's just uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut, right? Clear splitting, yeah. So those are the number of cuts are different too. So they, uh -huh. they, 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 for a perfect division, you and in this case, you need something like more than n cuts. So in fact, oh, two okay, n. Okay. Yeah. Does it make sense? Okay. So here, uh, apart from this, nothing is known that uh, if we impose the number. Uh, uh, this restriction on number of pieces, then this is like, we need these mild assumptions of like nothing, nothing like those uh, perfect partitioning exist here. So those perfect partitioning also don't require too strong an assumptions, but the, re the requirement of a perfect cake division is stronger. It says that BAI, like BAIB for all A and B has, is the same. Okay. So I can like in the, that that effectively means that and that does not work with end cuts. You can come up with simple examples. So there, like each uh, piece would maybe have let's say on average two p like each I would consist of two pieces. So here I'm saying a single interval per agent. There it might be two, but then the point is that uh, you have this cut and you can just arbitrarily assign it among the agents and it will be perfect. So it's a more demanding. Uh, requirement. However, the number of cuts then goes up. So okay. each agent in that case can get two pieces or on average two pieces. So does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe if you want, we can talk about it offline too. The, the like even the underlying under the hood, the results are different in the sense that this uses uh, this is a PPAD argument, like a fixed point theorem of Sperner. Those are more uh, uh, Bursa Coulomb type arguments. So they go up a complexity class. They fall in PPA. So there's necklace splitting, and there's some recent very nice work that shows that the similar problem called consensus halving, and even those are like the complexity, even at a complex, like computational complexity level, the, the problems are um, have different underlying flavors. So yeah, I, I'll not talk about perfect cuts, but yeah, maybe offline we can chat a bit more about it. Excellent. So um, yeah, major result by Sue. Uh, the, what I want to say is that this is purely an existential paradise, right? Like uh, nothing about this result gives me an algorithm. In fact, even if I relinquish this requirement that every agent is getting a single connected piece and I allow for crumbs across the agents, the best known algorithm that gets exact envy freeness runs in hyper exponential time. So towers of six, that's the best known algorithm even with disconnected pieces. And if you think this is bad, let me actually rub salt in the spoon and give you this very strong negative result by strong quiz that shows, says that let alone a exponential time algorithm, there's no finite time algorithm for this if the valuations are being specified by an adversary. That's a strong negative result. In fact, holds for three agents. Okay, so why am I doing all this? Like I have uh, enticing you with a cake result and then telling you nothing is known algorithmically. And in fact, I've like digressed into this world of envy freeness and uh, have somehow not talked about welfare and national welfare or generalized welfare for the past few slides. Well, the reason is because uh, positive results can be obtained if we look at approximations. So in this joint work with uh, Ishwar, Rachitesh and Nidhi, we showed that if you have approximate envy freeness, you in fact also get an approximation guarantee for NAS social welfare. I'll formally spell out what both sides mean and I'll give you the exact reference at the end of the talk. But yeah, the, the two interesting points here is that there is connection between the envy freeness and NAS social welfare, even when we have approximate envy freeness. And the, like towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll show you a polynomial method that finds approximately envy free allocations. It bypasses the strongest result by finding not exact envy free, but approximately envy free allocations. The next slide I'll define precisely what I mean by approximate envy freeness. Okay, so that's the agenda for hopefully the next 20 minutes or so. So here's the setup. Let me just quickly remind you I have a cake. That's the resource, the interval zero one that I want to divide. Every agent wants a interval. So I subscript 
One is the interval that I assign to agent one. I subscript two is the interval I assign to agent two, so on and so forth. The agent's cardinal preferences are specified by this valuation function, and I'll only need Oracle access to these valuations. Okay, so here's the definition, rather a natural one. Um, I, I'll say that a collection of intervals, a cake division is alpha NV free if the NV is multiplicatively bounded by one over alpha. So what this says is that if, again, both sides evaluated with respect to A's valuation for all pairs of agents, agent A's value for the interval that's been assigned to her is at least as much as one over alpha times the value she has for any other agent's interval. So if alpha equals one, I get exact NV freeness. See alpha is two, that means that my NV is multiplicatively bounded by one half, and this has to hold for all pairs of agent. So that's NV. Uh, what is NAS social welfare in this context complementarily? So I can define, it's the geometric mean of valuations. And in this setup, it will be the geometric mean of these VIIIs. I look at all the agents, look at the value that they're uh, acquiring from the interval assigned to them, that the geometric mean is the NAS social welfare. So right now these are two orthogonal fairness constructs, what I want to do is connect them. And this is the formal connection. What I'll show to you is that any alpha NV free uh, cake division is in fact uh, two alpha approximate with respect to NAS social welfare. So you, there's nothing algorithmic about this. This is just a property of al alpha NV free divisions. But what I'm saying is give me a uh, NV free division where the NV is multiplicatively bounded by one over alpha that allocation will achieve a NAS social welfare that is within a factor of one over two alpha of the optimal NAS social welfare of the, of the NAS social welfare that can be achieved by any partition of the cake into N intervals and then the assignment among the agents. So that's the result I want to prove. In fact, the proof is going to fit in this slide. Um, maybe I'm jumping in the gun. I just want to ask, so, so you mean that the alpha MV3 division is itself a two alpha approximation, right? Will you modify it somehow? Say that again, Iman. Like, like the, the alpha NV free division yes. is itself a two alpha approximation, or will you modify that allocation to get a? No, no, no. It's itself. Any, okay. yeah. So if I1, I through IN is alpha NV free, that is, it satisfies this yellow inequality, it will have a two approximation for the optimal NAS social welfare. Thanks. Yeah, not, I, I won't even touch it. Yeah. So yeah, this sort of alludes to what was being asked, like what is the connection between NV freeness and NASH? This is one, actually there are many and in like very drastically different, even in like things where we are dealing with discrete objects, there are very sort of beautiful connections between these two solution concepts. And ask me offline why I think the, the, this is the right connection. Okay, so um, this is the joint work. I The proof will fit in this slide. In fact, by design, I've picked results that fit in one slide for flexing technical muscles. I'll just point you to papers. It makes life easier for both of us. So yeah, uh, if you think this is too simple, this is, uh, you can thank me, it's, it's by design. Here's the proof. It actually follows from just look staring at this picture. So um, start off with an arbitrary alpha NV free allocation. So say I1 through IN is a part N partition of this cake zero one different agents based on the subscript are getting different intervals. And this is alpha NV free. That is the NV is uh, multiplicatively bounded by uh, one over alpha. And at the same time, I, let me consider a Nash optimal allocation an allocation that's maximizing Nash uh, social welfare. So among all N partitions of the cake, among all partitions, among intervals of the cake, this I star is the one that maximizes the geometric mean, maximizes the NAS social welfare. So in this optimal, and uh, let's fix an agent A, any agent A. In this optimal, agent A is receiving this orange interval, let's say I star A. So I'm looking now, I'm defining the set KA, which are all intervals in this alpha NV free allocation that intersect with I star A. So let me spell this out. So capital KA for any fixed agent A, are all intervals in the alpha NV free solution that are intersecting with the optimal interval. So note that at this time, I don't have either the alpha NV free solution nor the Nash optimal one. This is completely an analytic exercise, but I can define this, right? Both are like both cake divisions partition zero one into N parts. So fine, I, I have this collection of intervals and this is capital KA. 
small k is defined as the cardinality of this set. So in this figure for this agent A, there are three intervals that intersect with I star A. So small k A is three, right? One, two, three. Okay, so here's the first inequality, which is pretty much on the nose, follows from the definition of alpha and inferior. So what I'm seeing is that, okay, if I look at the valuation that any agent A receives in this alpha and V free allocation I, and multiply that by K A times alpha, then that is at least as much as what A is receiving in the optimal allocation, right? Why is that? Well, this is simply because alpha V A I A is more than each of these, the value of each of these intervals, right? So if every interval in capital K A for alpha V A I A is more than V A, let's say it's more than V A I B, alpha V A I A is also more than V A I C and so on and so forth. This is the definition of what it means to be an alpha and V free allocation. There are K A such intervals. So their union covers I star A, so if I sort of multiply that by Ka, I get this inequality. So with this additional Ka alpha, I value in this alpha and V free is at least as much as the optimal value for any agent A. Okay, fine. Just a property of alpha and V freeness and the definition of Ka. And to know that the valuations are additive. So and I, this entire union, the value would be at most this left-hand side. Okay, here's the slick um, counting thing. And this is probably the only sort of uh, cuteness in this proof. And the point is that if I look at the average value, the arithmetic mean of these k's, then that in fact is no more than two, right? So there are n intervals in this alpha and v free, n intervals in this optimal. And if I look at this intersection count, uh, a counting argument, you can convince yourself that on average, this Ka value is at most two, or the sum of these Ka's is upper bounded by two n, right? So the only like the right end points of every IB is for one interval. It's only the last interval that sort of contributes to two I star A. So if you, I'll pause here, like take a sip of water, but uh, yeah, uh, hope that you're convinced with both these inequalities because that's all I'm going to use to establish this lemma. And I cannot assuming over here that uh, that I star is contiguous, right? It can be this. I am assuming that. You are is okay. I see. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if like it's it's like I mean the sum is two n, which is the sum of intervals here and the sum of intervals here. Okay. So if it had many many pieces, um, then the, the this would go up. It won't be two n. It like if you bring this n here, it won't be two n. It will be the number of intervals in both. Okay. Yeah. So I am using that, but it's a fair comparison because I'm looking at Nash optimal um, only across K divisions where every agent is getting a contiguous piece, like a connected sub interval. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So actually I'm done. This is all I'll need to prove this lemma. Why is that? Here it is. So let's start with the Nash optimal solution. So this is the best possible Nash social welfare you can achieve across all k activations where every agent is getting a single interval. So that's the geometric mean. Great. Um, I can pointwise replace this value by the left-hand side. So just plugging in this inequality. So if I have this additional multiplicative factor of alpha k a, then I have this inequality. It's a pointwise substitution. The geometric mean is monotone. Fine. So alpha is a common term, pops out. This is a product. So I. I can write it as a geometric mean of these KAs and separately geometric mean of these uh, VAIAs, the values that the agent is getting in this alpha free NB free allocation. And this geometric mean of values is nothing but the Nash social welfare of the uh, in alpha NB free allocation. So that's, that's, I just write it as NSW, but I'm left with is this geometric mean. Well, I just use the arithmetic mean geometric mean property since the geomet arithmetic mean is at most two, the geometric mean cannot be more than two. That's it. That gives me the last inequality. So what I get is that the Nash social welfare of this alpha and V free allocation is at least one over two alpha of this globally optimal allocation. There you go. We started out with the NV free division and I've 
prove to you that it will always be a two alpha approximation to the Nash social. That, that's it, QED. So one question. So here you don't need any assumption like Sue's result. It is, I mean, even for, does it work for even uh, non-continuous kind of valuation? Uh, I did sum this up, uh, Arindam. Like, so this part, right, uses the fact that the VA of uh, this union is the sum of the VAs of this. But if you have a, a sub-additive valuation, this will hold true. Okay. I have not used continuity here. You're right. I will use it to establish the existence of this. But let me kind of point out uh, a crucial difference. This entire thing I'll pull off even the existence of uh, approximate NV3 allocation via purely a potential method. Whereas Sue's result is actually under the hood, it, it's a parity argument. Sperner is a parity argument on steroids. It's a PPAD. Uh, it belongs to this class PPAD, whereas this entire proof I'll give you will is a purely potential argument. So that in, in some sense, I am going to prove to you the existence and in like an independent standalone proof to you of the existence of approximate NV3 solutions. I will not rely on Sue in that sense, but yeah. Thanks. Make sense? Is there... Okay, uh, 10 minutes and I'll try to wrap up. Five minutes, I'll try to wrap up. So that's the connection, fine. Um, what I want to show next, and maybe I'll go over board by a few minutes, but uh, just bear with me is that, uh, in fact, you can find two NV free allocations and what when I say, this alpha equal to, I mean that the NV is multiplicatively bounded by one half. And I'll give you a polytime algorithm for this. Um, next few slides. What these two together tell me is that uh, NAS social welfare maximization and admits a four approximation. So in particular, I'll use this result to find a two NV free allocation. That two NV free is guaranteed to be a four approximation courtesy the lemma that I just discussed. So um, one point is that this is a honorable is a data in and of itself. Um, it's a beautiful problem. You can, even if you don't like Nash, I think this is a great direction of study. Finding approximation results for uh, NV free cake division is, is, is a noble pursuit in, its, in and of itself. So um, this just happens to be an advantageous uh, sort of add on. The fact that you get a constant factor, like a factor mm -hmm. to uh, blow up in Nash social welfare, is, is a great add on, I think. Okay, quickly, since I'm short on time, here's the final part, which is, uh, so I showed you approximate NV free implies approximate NAS social welfare. Let me give you an algorithm for maximizing, sorry, for approximating uh, NV freeness. So it's a very, again, like the, my, I'll hold my promise of single slide results. It's a cute algorithm, a slick algorithm as you see it. So what I'll do is this iterate, like interval growing idea. I'll assign interval to agent starting with the empty one. So PA is the interval that agent A gets and these PA keep changing, but they keep growing in value. But throughout as the algorithm marches on, I will maintain approximate, I'll maintain NV freeness up to this, let's say polynomially small term epsilon. So I'll keep assigning larger and larger valued pieces. So I'll grow these intervals PA, PA kind of keep shifting them. So again, PA is the interval for agent A, PB would be the agent for interval agent B, but I'll maintain this as an invariant throughout my algorithm. So what's the idea? So let's say I have, I am somewhere, I have these PAs assigned to the agents and this is not going to cover the entire cake. A large chunk of the cake say is unassigned. So U1, U2 are the unassigned pieces. PAPB are the intervals given to different agents. Now it could be, so what I have is that between agents, they don't envy each other by epsilon, but they can value some unassigned pieces quite a lot. In particular, when you start off, everyone has the empty piece. So the unassigned piece is actually the entire K. So you are really envious of this unassigned pieces. But what I'll do is as long as there is an unassigned piece that's envied by any agent, let's say, envied by more than this additive factor, small additive factor of epsilon. What I'll do is I'll execute a moving knife over this unassigned interval. So what do I mean? So let's say I have this 
unassigned interval u1, both a and b value u1 epsilon more than their current uh, interval. So VA PA is epsilon less than VA U1, VB PB is epsilon less than VB U1. So they, they actually would prefer U1 over their epsilon prefer over their current interval. What I'll do is I'll start at the left end of this unassigned interval. U1 is not given to any agent. And I run a, I keep moving the knife, a hypothetical knife to the left. So here the and left end point of U1 just happens to be zero. It could be anywhere, but I'll stop as soon as any one of the agents tells me that now to the left of the, this knife cut, the interval is epsilon more than my current value. So here, let's say I stop when agent A just so happens to shout that, look, this red thing, I value it mo epsilon more than my current uh, partition, current interval PA. So note that this is the first agent that shouted the first agent that said that this left, this shaded thing, red shaded is more than my current value. So no one will actually envy this more by more than epsilon because they didn't shout. So what I can do is agent A can relinquish her interval. So the unassigned interval here grows and can take this part PA. So I have maintained this invariant explicitly by running this moving knife. Uh, over time, it just give me two more minutes. So what ends up happening is it, it, but at every iteration, the value of the agent increases by epsilon. The total value of the cake is normalized to one. So this will, uh, this, this will iterate only a linear number of times. So every agent can sort of change her partition at most one over epsilon times. And so after n over ep epsilon iterations, you will stop. And at termination, what you'll have is that not only do I have NV freeness among the assigned bundles, but I'll have NV freeness among even for the intervals that are unassigned. So let's say I terminate with this. So note that there are N assigned intervals. Every agent is getting, like agent one is getting P1, agent two is getting P2 and so on. So there are N assigned intervals. So there are at most N plus one unassigned intervals. So these U1, U2 can be at most N plus one. With a smart bit of post-processing, you can actually ensure that there are only N assigned intervals. So these U1, U2 is at most N of these. And then what you can do is simply club the unassigned with an adjacent assigned one. So you look at agent A, this is at termination. There might be an unassigned piece to its right. So you club it. You, and this is the final interval that agent A gets. Um, agent B at termination was getting PB. You look at an interval to its right, this might be empty, but in this example, there is one. So you club it together, this connected piece goes to agent B because she was getting PV, so on. So you have an assigned one, and assigned ones, they are interlaced. You just do these pairings, and this is the final allocation. My simple claim to you is that this is half NV free. Why? Um, this is the final equation. Well, if I look at two times the value that agent A is acquiring right at the end, this is at least two times PA, right? IA is bigger than PA, monotonicity. And uh, so VA PA by itself is at least VA PB. This was the invariant. Also, because you terminated whatever interval was given to PB, in this case, this is U2, you have VA PA is at least PA U prime. So this twice of this is more than the sum of these individually and with a minus two epsilon because that's the slack, but this P P A and U together form I B. So I have like again here I'm using additivity, subadditive would suffice. So what I have is that this sum is more than the value that A has for B's uh, interval. There's a factor two, and hence this is up to this small two epsilon. You have a two NV free allocation. That's it. So yeah, you have a question, Shushman? Uh, yeah. So the thing is. Uh, when we assign PA to agent A and B to agent B and so on, oh. the, the knife moving thing ensured that A is not envious of B's allocation. But when we assign the unassigned portion U2 to B along with PB, how do, are we guaranteeing that agent is now not, agent A is now not envious of the new extended assignment to B? Huh. Because it's the valuations are additive. 
So sure. the value for this whole thing, which value for IB is value for this plus value for this. Correct. And individual. So look at from A's perspective, right? She has guaranteed to receive PA. In in fact, something more. Yeah. Now, for A again, everything with A's perspective, this PA is at least PB, hmm. and PA is also at least U. That's why I terminated. Otherwise, the algorithm would have marched on. Right. Okay. Correct. Sorry. So, yeah, this two. That's the part. Yeah. Things, like the first one is this. The second two is more. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, slightly over time. Uh, apologies for that. But this is sort of the main theorem. Um, I have a two approximation algorithm, uh, two NV freeness algorithm, and gives me a four approximation. Um, so as I said, this is a great problem. I really like it. If you think back uh, or you read the paper, you you'll see that this actually gives us a one third additive guarantee. So um, this two and this two is a multiplicative one. You can the same analysis actually tells you the bit of thought that. You act, the, the same allocation is actually one third additively NV freeness. That the there's the additive NV between any two agents is at most one third. In a recent work with Pooja, we sort of improve it to one fourth, and it does require like some like hitting set ideas and it's like that's it's like I mean it's more intricate than the slick idea that I just presented. But yeah, the additive bound can be improved. Improving on the multiplicative one is a great open question. There are positive results for special valuation classes. Like there's a book by Nidhi that talks about so-called MLRP valuations, but in general, yeah, getting even a QP task is a great, great question. Um, yeah, for welfare, I have some results. It reduces to uh, what is called job interval section problems. It's a bit classic problem in interval scheduling. Uh, I gave you a constant factor approximation for NASH. It's in fact, NASH and other welfare in this range are APX hard, and as I said, it's a great problem to improve upon these approximation bounds, obtain complementary hardness approximation results. And in terms of welfare, this egalitarian world is wide open. There's a two in approximability, but there is no, no, no non-trivial approximation for this egalitarian cake division. So yeah, that's again a nice question to my mind. Uh, here's the paper that I talked about. This is the Mullins book talks about the axiomatic stuff. Um, if the slides are there, these YouTube links will give you the SUS proof and such. And for some contemporary perspective of uh, fairness in algorithmic decision making, I'd recommend you read these two recent surveys. So I'll, I'll just stop here and thank you for your time. Okay, thanks a lot, Siddharth. That was a great talk. Um, maybe one quick question before the. Uh, Please. Does somebody have a question to ask? No. Otherwise, you know, we can do this offline and you have another session coming up. So we can do Great. that. Yeah, yeah. Think I'm um, so I guess we'll take a five minute break before the next session. Is that, is that fine, Sushma? Um, okay. Thank we'll, you. We'll see everybody. Bye. Thanks. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hey, hi. Hi. So, uh, in the in that uh, moving uh, knife setting, we are still uh, caring for the cakes to be contiguous pieces, right? We are. So, what happens when the cake, uh, like the knife, moves? So, we have allocated one, uh, like two pieces for two agents already, A and B. No, yeah, for two different days. So every agent is getting just a piece and I, so can I share the slides again? Let's see if I can, oh, I think I can do that. Yeah, we'll stop before Kavita comes. Yeah, so yeah, he's saying Vishwa, yeah. So here um, it's, so right now A is getting this single interval PA and mm -hmm. B is getting the single interval PB. Mm -hmm. This so happens that both of them value U1 uh, epsilon more than their current piece with respect to their own valuation. Uh, okay. So U1 is a large, say, unassigned piece. It okay, so, so the knife is never going to move over one of these assigned cake before somebody already shouts stop. Exactly. Like if it's too small already, I'll not care. Okay. Because at the end, I just want this inequality, which for those intervals, it's not. So it's only 
Yeah, so it's only when this happens that I run the moving knife. Okay. Yeah. This this looks very similar to that uh, Dobin Spanier algorithm of moving uh, knife. Connectivity. Moving knife is of course very popular, but this sort of a iteration growing, to my knowledge, is not that, like any non yeah. approximation was not known before. So yeah, the, the, there are like the connectivity and this just it, yes like, yeah stuff around is sort of important yeah yeah and yeah again like this is purely a potential argument no like I have not used any parity arguments. So. I yeah. think the slides would be shared by the organizers. So, yeah. Uh, yes, we'll share the slides as well as YouTube links. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. That was a fantastic talk.